Today's reading is from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. This is God's word for us today. You may be seated. Thank you, Isaiah. Well, welcome to the Gathering of Grace Community Church. So glad that you have chosen to worship with us here this morning. By way of introduction, as we are drawing closer to the close in our series of, in the book of Mark, I'd like to ask you have, you, have you ever wondered, in light of your own sin, in light of your constant failures or your continued failures and, and the resolutions that you say, I'm, I'm done with that particular sin and yet to fail and again and again and again and again. Have you ever wondered... Um, whether God is ever going to turn his face away from you. Is that thought ever entered your mind? And if it has, if it has, where do you derive comfort? I mean, when you're face to face with your own failure, when you're face to face with your own sin, how do you know that he's not going to turn away from you? I mean, how, do you, how does anyone know that? I mean, the Apostle Paul himself said, I know the good that I want to do. I know the good that I want to do, but it's the evil that I don't want to do. I keep doing that. How does Paul know that God's not going to just say, you know what, I, I'm, I've, I've had it. You, that's the last straw. How do you know that, that you're not going to break that last straw? How do you know? How does anyone know? We're going to look at a text um, today that's going to answer that question for us. Uh, the, the text is, the reason that we can know that we are not going to be, God's not going to turn his face away from us is because he turned his face away from his son. We're going to look at a very, very painful passage. We're going to look at the words of Jesus, which he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken? That word forsaken, it simply means to be abandoned or to be deserted. And the answer to the question, how do I know? How does the Apostle Paul know? How does anyone who is in Christ know that they won't be forsaken? The answer to that question is because Christ was forsaken. That's, that's the answer to the question. But we have to dig into this passage because this is... This is the climax, this is the culmination of everything that Mark has been leading us through as we're looking at the life of Christ. Jesus comes in the beginning and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And then he follows that up with his baptism and then he follows that up with, with demonstrating that he has the authority over nature, over disease, over sickness. He has the authority to forgive sin. He has the authority over nature. He has authority. And then he, he, he acknowledges Peter's confession that he is the Christ. And then he demonstrates what kind of Christ he is, what kind of Messiah. And then in this latter portion of Mark, he's been moving towards the culmination of, of accomplishing the saving purpose for which he became man. And it ends right there with that question, with that question. We're going to look at three things this morning. We're going to take a look at what do we see in the text? What does Mark reveal for us? We're going to see it. Then we're going to ask the question, well, what does it mean? I mean, yes, there's a blow-by-blow -blow account of what was done and what was said, but what's the significance? And the last thing we're going to look at is how do I respond? What's your response to what Jesus has done and accomplished on the cross? And we're going to celebrate that response through the taking of communion. 
So open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 15, and let's invite the Spirit to guide us through his word. Father, we thank you for the giving of your Son. We thank you, Lord, that he uh, willingly was forsaken on our behalf, and we pray that as we open up this teaching and we look at this very painful moment for the Son of God, that you would guide us into all truth, Lord, that you would speak truth to our hearts, that you would accomplish the good purpose, your good purpose in and through the preaching of your word. Help me to teach and preach in your power and not my own, that Christ might be exalted. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we go. What do we see? What we see, first of all, it, when it was the sixth hour, now when you're reading the New Testament and it says the sixth hour, some translations will, will tell you what that is in modern equivalent. That means noon. The first hour is 6 a.m., so noon is the sixth hour. So it's not 6 a.m., it's noon. It's high noon. So it is high noon. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So from noon to three, it's dark. It's noon to... It's so awkward. I'm going to have to tie my shoe. This is not going to work. <laughs> I stepped on it. I pulled it. And like, I'm not going to walk around with my shoe untied. So let's just pretend this doesn't happen. There's a pause. And then... It's noon to three, <laughs> darkness covered the whole earth. Darkness covered the whole earth. Now, we have an eclipse coming up. How many of you are actually going to travel out of state to see the eclipse in April? Okay, a few of you. I know some people are going to maybe head to Texas or wherever that, uh, that line is that's where, where it's going to be at its peak. This is not an eclipse. How do we know it's not an eclipse? Because it lasts for three hours. Eclipse don't last for three hours. They're momentary. It gets gradually darker, and then it's dark, and then it gets gradually lighter, and then it's light. They're a, they're a natural phenomenon. This is a supernatural phenomenon. Think back to the Exodus, the ninth plague, the plague of darkness, where it was dark. It was dark. And, and, and over, over Egypt. So this is a supernatural darkness until the ninth hour. And then at three o'clock at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's take a look at, first of all, what's going on here. Jesus is on the cross. He's on the cross. Now, the Assyrians, the Assyrians are the one who invented crucifixion. The Romans are the one who perfected crucifixion. Crucifixion is an excruciating form of torture and death by which the person crucified, sounds like someone's being crucified right now, <laughs> cried out with a loud voice, why have you forsaken me? When someone is crucified, they don't die of blood loss. They die of asphyxiation. So what is happening is Jesus is on the cross. He's nailed through the wrists here and then the ankles. And as the person's weight is hanging here, their upper body and their muscles and their core become paralyzed and they can no longer draw a breath. So in order to draw a breath, you have to push up to relieve the pressure off of your chest muscles and your back and your arms so that you can release the core muscles here so you can draw a breath. So this is an, but the, it's too painful to push up on the spike that's driven through your ankles. So you succumb to the pain and you drop back down. So it's this, this I've got to push up just long enough so I can draw a breath. I can't do it anymore. And so it's this agonizing process. And usually it takes Almost, sometimes even days for the person to succumb to asphyxiation. So that's what's happening on the cross. That's what's physically happening on the cross. So you might think, so that certainly is the reason why Jesus is asking, why have you forsaken me? Why have you allowed me to experience such excruciating physical torment and pain? That would be a reasonable question, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking, this is actually a quote from Psalm chapter 22. Yes, it is Jesus' words. It's the expression of his own heart, but it's also a quotation from Psalm 22. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to turn there and just read you a couple verses. This is David. 
It's a Psalm of David, and he starts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From my words and my groanings. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. By night, but I find no rest. You are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel, and, your father, and you are fathers trusted, and they deliver, you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and I am not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And then later it says, They pierced my hands and my feet, and they cast lots for my clothing. There's no time in the history of David where anyone pierced his hands and feet and cast lots for his clothing. What is David, what is he writing? This is a prophetic psalm pointing to his descendant who would be pierced for our transgressions. David knows, or rather David does not know why he's even writing this, just that it foreshadows the coming of the Messiah. But Jesus knows why David wrote that because he's fulfilling the very purpose for which he was born. So in one sense, it's a question, but it's a question he already knows the answer to. But that doesn't negate the anguish, that doesn't negate the anguish and the feeling of abandonment that he feels. So it's both a question, but it's not a question. It's a statement. He knows why he's being forsaken. He knows why he's being forsaken. So let's keep reading. What else do we see? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge of sour wine and put a reed on it and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let's wait and see whether Elijah will come down to take him. There was a belief in Judaism that Elijah would would come and precede the Messiah. And they also believed that the Messiah, the Messiah being righteous, could never suffer indignity or injustice, that God would never abandon someone who is righteous to to such an injustice. And so, well, if, if he's the Messiah, surely Elijah is going to come and rescue him. And so they wait. And so they watch. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. We know from the book of John that that loud cry is, it is finished. And verse 38 The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, let's stop right there. Mark inserts something that you could not have observed in the vicinity of the cross. This doesn't take place at the foot of the cross. This tearing of the curtain takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. They're outside of the city gates. They're outside of the city wall. The temple is in the city and this is the rendering of the, the curtain that, that separates the, into the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go to offer uh, this, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. One day a year. That curtain was torn from top to bottom. So Mark thinks it's important that we know this little detail of what occurred while Jesus was being crucified, when he breathed his last, when he uttered the words, it is finished, the curtain in the Holy of Holy was torn from top to bottom at a different location in Jerusalem. Mark thinks that's important. We'll get to understand, we'll understand why here in a minute. But that's what we're seeing. And then in verse 39, and when the centurion, a Roman, a Gentile, not a Jew, not looking for or awaiting the Messiah, just carrying out his orders under Pontius Pilate, And when this centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the first confession of a Gentile that Jesus is the Son of God. This is significance. This is the purpose for which Jesus was born. So that's what we see. That's what we see. What does it mean? What does it mean? We're going to look at three things. Generically, an overview, it means that Jesus was forsaken in our place. 
It means that if you are in Christ, the reason that you will never be forsaken despite your failures, despite the fact that you've made resolutions that you're going to change, despite the fact that you said you're going to be more patient, despite the fact that you said you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and that the good that you want to do is not the good that you do, but the evil that you don't want to do is that you keep on doing, and there's this inner frustration, and there's this battle, and you're frustrated with yourself, and you're, you're thinking, surely this is the last straw. God's going to cast me away. How do I know he's not? This is why you can know that he's not going to. It's because Christ was forsaken in your place. So we have to see three things. We have to see what sin is, what sin does, and what Jesus accomplished by being forsaken on our behalf. This is the essence of the gospel. You got to understand what the bad news is, but you also have to understand what the good news is. And you have to understand what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross does for you as someone who is in Christ. Everything rests on this. This is the pinnacle of the gospel of Mark. You say, well, what about the resurrection? There, it's the same event. But this, this half of it, the death, the death of Christ, is what we're looking at today. We'll look at the resurrection next week. But this is the pinnacle. So what is sin? Okay. John 3, 19. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Sin, at its essence, is to turn away from God. That's what it is. The technical world, the the word for sin in in the Greek is hamartia. It It means to miss the mark. We're not even aiming at the mark. And and what what John does here is recording the words of Jesus in his conversation with Nicodemus. This is right after the famous, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then he says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but the people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. Sin is the forsaking of God. It's, it's turning away. That's what it is. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you deserting me? Why are you turning your face away? The reason that he's done this is because we've turned our face away from God. We've chosen to walk in the darkness. Way, way back in Genesis chapter 3, our our ancestors, Adam and Eve, chose to turn from the light and stepped into the darkness because they thought that by doing so, by declaring their independence from God, they could become like God. They, They abandoned God. They forsook God. They deserted him and turned from him. That's the essence of sin. That's the essence of sin. It's a willful decision to walk in the darkness. It can be done consciously by shaking your fist at God, saying, God, I will not, and therefore you turn willingly away from God. It can also be done passively in just a generic apathy. There's no willful decision that I will not follow God. It's just, I'm just going to follow the inclination of my own heart. You never think about God. You never consider yourself an enemy of God. You just don't consider God at all. And by definition, because you're not walking in the light in fellowship with Christ, you find yourself walking in darkness. But you don't feel that it's darkness. I mean, you can read, you can write, the sun comes up. It's not dark. It's spiritually dark because we're not walking in the presence of God apart from Christ. Sin is the forsaking or abandonment of God. What does that, in, what does that lead to? Let's take a look at John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. This is the message we've heard from him and we proclaim to you, that God is light. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. There is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't 
practice the truth. So what sin does, what sin does is it separates us from God and it brings darkness. So as Jesus is on the cross at noon, what happens? It becomes dark. It becomes dark. When you are in Christ, when you walk in the light, God is light. The reason it's becoming dark is because God the Father is turning his face away from the Son. The light is going out. And that's what sin does. When we turn from God, in this case, God is turning his face from Christ, his son. He's turning his face from Christ. But the effect is the same. When we turn from God, away from God, turn from looking at to God to away from him, we, we walk in darkness. This is what happens. That's the effect of sin. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, he says, but your iniquities, it's another, it's another word for sin, your sins, they've made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face. What does Jesus say? My God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your face from me? The answer is because of sin. Our sins have hidden his face from us so that he does not hear. That's what spiritual darkness is. That's what spiritual darkness is. The prophet Amos says this about the day of judgment. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at what time? Noon. I will make the sun go down at noon. And darken the earth in broad daylight. And I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. And I will make it like the morning for, of an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. What sin does is it separates us from God. When we turn our face away from him, when we forsake God, we turn and we walk into the darkness... The consequences of that is we get what we desired. If your desire is to be independent of God, the bad news is that God will give you what you want. He will give you the darkness you desire. You say, well, I don't desire darkness. The definition of darkness is to turn your face away from God. And when you turn your face away from God, your sins cause a separation from God and he ceases to hear you. And you are walking alone. And this is why Jesus, with all the different parables, he talks about the wicked servants. He talks about the, 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 those who won't forgive. He talks about those who, the, the sheep and the goats. He always says, and they will be cast out into outer darkness, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is judgment, to be cast out into outer darkness. Ironically, this is what people want. They don't want judgment. They don't want weeping. They don't want gnashing of teeth. They just want to be left alone from this, this God in heaven. They just want to rule their own lives. They just want to be their own lamps. They just want to be their own lights. They just want to be their own gods. They want independence from God, and God says, fine, fine. Fine, you are now independent and separate from me. Do you know, if God is light, if God is the source of life, to turn from him is darkness and to turn from him is death. And that's what judgment is. Darkness and death. Darkness and death. This is what the Bible defines as hell. See, how could a loving God cast someone to hell? A better question is, why would God turn his face away from his son so that we wouldn't be in hell? That's a fair question worth answering. But understand what hell and judgment is. It is God giving us over to what we have longed for all along. Some of you are like, no one longs for hell. Of course they don't but they long for independence from God. You can't have it both ways. You cannot long from, for independence from the source of life and the sort of, source of light. 
You can't long for that and not long for death and darkness simultaneously. It's one and the same. The enemy makes it attractive, but the end is death and darkness. And that's what sin does. It brings death and it brings darkness. Turning the corner. Said the gospel, you first of all have to understand the bad news. It's not good news until you understand why it's good. So turning the corner to the good news, what did Jesus accomplish? John says it this way, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. Okay, there's something that happened on the cross in which what Jesus did atones for, cleanses, redeems, brings us into reconciliation, makes us, instead of children of wrath, children of God. Something happened at the cross. If we have fellowship with him and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, well, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all un righteousness from all unrighteousness if we say we have not sinned we make him into a liar and his word is not in us my little children I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin but if anyone does sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous look at verse 2 here we're going to learn a new word He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, how many of you use the word propitiation in the last seven days? Any of you? One nerd right there. (laughs) No, he's not a nerd. He's a Bible guy. And he also reads the King James Bible, which also translates it just like the ESV, propitiation. A lot of translations don't translate that word propitiation. They translate it atonement. He is the atonement for our sin. The word propitiation, it means to satisfy wrath. Satisfy wrath. So so what what it means literally is that God looks at those who have forsaken him, turned from him, and his wrath remains on them. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were by nature dead in our trespasses and sins when we used to follow, the, by our, follow our flesh and, and the prince of the power of the air. He said we were by nature children of wrath. What does that mean? It means because we walk in the darkness, because we've forsaken God, God's wrath and his anger remains on us. We are declared enemies And he gives us over to our sins, and that leads to death, destruction, and wrath. His justice is fulfilled. Not good news for for those who are the objects of his wrath, but that's just the way it is. But what what is John saying? He's the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? What it means is that when Jesus is on the cross, the wrath of the Father is 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 poured out on his son. Not those who have turned from him. Do you, see the, do you see the thick irony here? The only human being who didn't turn his face away from God, who lived in perfect obedience, was his son. And he's the one who absorbs the very wrath and judgment of God. The one who walked in the light, who is the light, embraced the darkness for you and for me. That's what propitiation means. And not not just for you, and not just for me, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you want to know why we're having a missions course in April? It's because there's people on the other side of the globe who've never heard the name of Jesus. 
Do you want to know why Jesus, after, right before he ascended into heaven, said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? It's because there are people that are walking in darkness who have never heard the name of Jesus. It's not just for you. It's not just for me. It's not just for Peter who denied him. It's not just for for the Jews. It's not just for the Gentiles. It's for all nations, the sins of the whole world. This this is mind-blowing. Here's what just took place. Here's what this means. It means that That our sin, my sin, I'll just go with me. Brooks Simpson, his sin, his rebellion, merits, earns judgment. And so does yours. It merits. I earned it. Paul says this, the wages of sin is death. If you worked a full day's labor and you didn't get paid, what do you call that? You call it injustice. The wages of sin, what that means is I earned it. The wages of sin is death, darkness, judgment, abandonment, separation from God. God turning his face away from me because I turned my face away from him. But that's not what I receive. What I, what I merit is judgment. What I merit is judgment. What I merit is to be forsaken by God. But who's forsaken? God's forsaken. God becomes man, takes on human flesh. Why? So that he would be forsaken in my stead, in your stead. Do you want to know why after the thousandth time you failed this last week, you will never be forsaken if you are in Christ? It's because Christ received what you deserved. He received what I deserved. But that's only the half of it. That's only half of the gospel. Do you know what the other half of the gospel is? The other half of the gospel is this. Jesus Christ's obedience merits reward. But he doesn't receive reward. He receives what? Judgment. Because he took what I deserved and he gives us what he deserved. Here's what this means in practical terms. It means that when God looks at you, if you are in Christ, he does not see someone who is simply forgiven. He sees someone who has the merits of Christ. He sees someone who is beautiful He sees someone who is holy. He sees someone who is perfect. He sees someone who is righteous. And the rewards of Christ are yours because he has gifted them to you. That's what it means to be justified by faith, to be declared not guilty in Christ. And to simultaneously, at the same time, be declared righteous. See, well, Brooks, how? I'm not righteous. I mean, nothing I do is righteous. It's a positional thing. It's because of who you are in Christ. Because when the Father sees you, if you are in Christ, he sees his Son. He does not see your sin. Your sin has been cast as far as the east is from the west. Christ has borne that away on the cross. What God sees, the Father sees when he sees someone who is in Christ, he sees someone who is righteous. Because he sees the merit of his son. Christ received what you and I deserved. And we we received what he deserved. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The short answer is so that you wouldn't be. And he knows that. He knows that the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12... 
For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. What is the joy? You ever wondered what, what possible joy is set before him as he endures this agonizing process of asphyxiation he is, as he bears the sin of the world? What joy is there in that? There's no joy in the process. The process isn't what gives him joy. It's, the, it's, it's what it accomplishes. It's what he accomplishes. And there's a lot that he accomplishes. It's not just to see us redeemed. Yes, it's that, but it's to see his father glorified. Your redemption brings glory to the father. Your forgiveness brings glory to the father. You know what, you know what, you know what Jesus glories in? The fact that, that you see yourself secure in him. That brings glory to him. That brings glory to him. That brings him joy to know that you know that you're secure and you will never be forsaken because he was forsaken in your stead. That brings him joy. So how do you respond? How How do we respond to that? How do we respond to that? This could be just nothing more than just a very interesting sermon on what Christ accomplished on the cross. You have to respond to this. You say, I don't have to do anything. The fact that you won't do anything is a response. To walk away from here and do nothing with Christ is to leave him there. It's to turn away and forsake the very Christ who was forsaken in your stead. So what does John say that we should do? Don't deny your sin, for to do so would be to, to it would be deceive yourself. But rather confess your sin. It's to simply come to him and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for being forsaken in my stead. Thank you for giving me a pardon and granting me righteousness, not of my own, but through your obedience. Thank you for grace. Save me from my sins. You know what the author of Hebrews says? The author of Hebrews says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will never be forsaken. Amen. Never. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. You cannot be condemned. You say, Lord, you say, Brooks, you don't know. You don't know me. I deserve, I know you deserve to be condemned, but Christ has been condemned in your stead. There is, he cannot be condemned again. He has bore the wrath. There is no more wrath. Do you know what's pent up behind the dam? Do you know what's pent up behind of that, that dam of when, when God looks at you who are, who are in Christ, who have been forgiven, and you keep, you keep failing? You think that his wrath is pent up. Do you know, what, you know what's pent up behind the dam? That's just waiting to pour out and sweep you away? It's not wrath. Do you know what it is? Mercy, compassion, his guts churn over his children. And Steve said right before the last song, he says that Christ is giving intercession for us right now. Do you know what that means? It means that he is praying, Father, pour out your spirit that they might see that I've been forsaken so that they will never be forsaken. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus was forsaken. So that you wouldn't be. We're going to celebrate communion this morning. At Grace, you can begin to pass out the elements. Communion is something that we celebrate as those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, please let the elements pass. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. If we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. 
But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So as a follower of Christ, take and eat. Hold the elements. We'll come back and we'll celebrate them together. If you're not in Christ, but you're like, but I want to be in Christ, then ask God to save you right now. Ask Christ to atone for your sins. Confess your sins to the Lord in the quietness of your own heart. And then join us in communion. But consider how you're going to respond as a follower of Christ. Walk in the light. Confess whatever sins you've you've been walking in. Even as a believer, confess them. That's what John says. Confess them and he will forgive you of your sins and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. And then we'll come back and we'll take the elements together. The night before Jesus said those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He led his disciples um, in the breaking of bread and the passing of the cup. And he took the bread and he passed it around and he broke it and he lifted it to his father and he says, take this and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. He knew why he was being forsaken. And then in the same way, the gospel writers proclaim that he took the cup and he says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of many. He knew why he was being forsaken. And what we celebrate when we take communion is to remember the conscious act of giving of himself so that we would never be forsaken. So let's take an E. Father, we thank you for the giving of your son, that he willingly laid down his life and accomplished all righteous requirements of the law and took the penalty of our sin, that we might be adopted, that we might be heirs in Christ, that we might be children of the king, that we might be citizens of heaven, that we might be the elect that we might never, ever be cast away or forsaken. So we receive this with glad and sincere hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. After we close and dismiss, I want to encourage you, if, uh, if you'd like to be prayed for, you have a prayer request, um, you just have burdens on your heart, there would be people here to pray with you. Now would you please stand as I read Hebrews chapter 13, 20 through 21 as a benediction. The author of Hebrews says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you again for the great and glorious sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. We commit ourselves to you. Help us to mindfully walk in the light, rejecting darkness. And when we stumble and when we fail, Lord, help us to have the good sense and the grace to draw near to you and confess so that we might be forgiven and purified from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that there is no more wrath to be poured out. Thank you that there is only mercy to be received. Help us to walk in a manner worthy of that calling that we have received. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless, go in grace, and we will see you next week.